Hey, greetings, my fellow friends, fellow Franco fans. I come to you today from the other side of the mirror. It is I, your host, Jason Rudy from Desperate Visions Productions. And uh, today we are here to do episode 21, El Otro Lado del Espacio, On the Other Side of the Mirror. Film number fifty three film number fifty three from Mr. Jess Franco, Mr. Jesus Franco Manera. So this is uh like I said, film number fifty three and uh this is a Zoom episode that I do with uh Miss Colisini from um Los Angeles, California. Home of the doors. Uh the second, or actually the third guest now from L.A., so that's cool. I had Dan Farron on for Girl from Rio, uh, Miss Amber Kloss on for Vampiros Lesbos and Faceless, and uh, now Kali Sini for On the Other Side of the Mirror. It's funny, I always write The Other Side of the Mirror, but it's actually On the Other Side of the Mirror. So I may reference it as The Other Side of the Mirror, so forgive my mispronunciation of On the, or actually On, so the only word missing. Um... This is a uh, Spanish and French co-production, 1973. Um, I'll take my glasses off so I can read a little better. It's funny, when you get older, you know, you got to have those adjustments. Original theatrical title and country of origin, El Otro Lado del Especio, on the other side of the mirror, Spanish title. Um, then also, okay, so this is an interesting thing before we start going into other titles. This film technically has like four cuts. Um... On this episode, it's interesting because my guest, she had seen the second cut, The Obscene Mirror, which uh, is the French theatrical re-edit, The Obscene Mirror, Le Mirror Obscene. And that uh, is the reworking of the plot on this film. So in this film, um, the uh, lead, Anna, in the uh, original version, and then she has a different name in the... French re-edit. She goes off to get married, but in the on the other side of the mirror, her father uh, hangs himself, and she sees his specter in the mirror. And on the French theatrical recut, it's her sister that she uh, had an affair with, and she killed herself, and she sees her in the mirror, and um, that's played by Lena Romay. So we see, and it's the uh, X-rated version, so Lena Romay is in... Um, hardcore scenes with uh, her husband and with uh, insert shots of other actors, hardcore insert shots. And then we see her with uh, different actresses, about two or three different actresses, um, naked in bed and stuff. Um, Alice Arno and uh, other ones that we'll go through as we get to that part. So yeah, that's the difference. Okay. So anyway, that's the second version. Uh, the third version is, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the mirror scene is the uh, is the f- French theatrical re-edit. Um, then there's the third version, which is uh, Le Specchio del Piacere. That's the Italian theatrical. That's the Mirror of Pleasure. Okay, so the mirror. Okay, so the first version is like what I said with Howard Vernon as the person that you see in the mirror. Second version is uh, the mirror scene with Lena Romay. And uh, that's the version with uh, her as the specter. And then this third version has the hardcore inserts, which you don't see in the second version. And that's just the insert shots of uh, penetration and more um, close-ups of the oral scenes with female, female, and female, and male. So that's the only difference. Um, And my guest had seen, I'm sorry, had seen that third version. And I have the third version as well. Um... La Specchio del Piacere. And sometimes when you buy... So, I had bought the Obscene Mirror from Trash Palace, and it was actually this version, the third version, and not the second one, so it had the hardcore inserts. And then uh, there's the fourth version, is which the one I had, which is... Uh, so funny, it's such a weave. So there's the fourth version, of course, is which the one I have, and that is... Um, Basically, a combination of uh, the first one, but with 
the nudity and stored or uh, restored. So, like, for instance, there's a scene in the Spanish one where she gets up to answer the phone and they have her in a bra um, answering the phone, photographed from the waist up. Well, the version I have has her getting up naked out of bed and answering the phone, which is technically the theatrical um, nudity version. Um, and with Howard Vernon as the specter and not Lena Romay. But so, yeah, so this fourth version is uh, a longer cut of the first version, and there's a lot more club scene jazz footage. There's the scene where she goes out with um, Piccio and his wife, and they go out shopping and with Al Sarno and go in the town, and that's a longer scene. And that's that's a longer cut, and that's the version I have. So I have the technically the third and fourth version. Um so yeah, it's interesting. That's one thing interesting about this episode is that there's so many cuts of one film, especially the the uh, recutting of putting a different actress in to the main like uh, the main um, antagonist, pretty much, and changing that focus and with redubbing. It's interesting how you can take a project and change it. And that kind of inspired me recently in a creative sense to uh, kind of go into that direction with something that. I've been working on so just the concept of that thought which is an interesting way of uh, shooting um, so yeah we have the alternate title of that one the Spicio di Piacere the Italian theatrical mirror of pleasure then we have a French alternate theatrical poster one uh, Virginity Forbidden which is uh, Virginette Interdite um, Italian th- video cover the mirror of desire Le Spicio del Distidero uh, unconfirmed titles through the looking glass um ultra oh, torture beyond the grave the dirty mirror obscene mirror lewd women that's what's a cool one the mirror obscene des femme obscenes alternate french theatrical uh production companies madrid uh fior productionaries cinematographies and uh compteur francais de france production paris Theatrical distributor CB Films from Madrid, Compure Francie du Film Production of Paris. So yeah, the timeline on this uh, shooting was like August 1973. Uh, won a Writer's Circle Award in January 20th of 1974. Uh, French visa issued for the Mirror of Scene uh, was on January 13th, 1975. And France was... Um, April 30th of 75, Barcelona, May 18th, 76, Madrid, February 21st, 77, Seville, May 18th, 78, and finally Italy, Rome, the uh, Lo Specchio di Pesieri, which I was said of the third version with the hardcore inserts, that was January 15th of 1981. So, uh, theatrical running time, Spain is 82 minutes, the French, France cut is 97 minutes. Cast of El Otro Lado del Espectro. Uh, Emma Cohen played Anna Oliveira. Robert Woods plays Bill the trumpet player. Francois Brown plays Tina. Philippe Lemaire plays Pipo. Alice Arno plays Carla and his cousin. Ramiro Oliveira plays Miguel Ferreira, a theater director. Walt Davis plays Valdemar Volthart. Um, uh, Arturo actually is. Wolfhart uh, plays Arturo Barbaro, Anna's husband-to-be. The great Howard Vernon plays Professor Oliveira, Anna's father. Maria Basso plays Elvira, Anna's aunt. Adelina Taller plays Stephanie, Bill's wife. Roger Sarbib plays Roger, the club pianist. And also uncredited, Jess Franco plays the jazz pianist. And Nicole Gautier plays Fran- Franca, Miguel's assistant. So the cut of the Lena Romay version, cast of Lemire Obscene, uh, Emma Cohen, and now instead of uh, Anna Oliveira, she plays Annette Whitman. So everybody has different credits on this, or different character names. Robert Wood is still Bill the trumpet player. Howard Vernon now is Professor Whitman, um, father of Marie and Annette. Philippe Lemire is still Pipo. Ellis Arnaud is now Clara, Annette's cousin. So she went from Cl- Carla to Clara. Uh, they should have just kept her name the same shit. What the hell, you know? It's much more difference. Uh, Lena Romay now is in here as Marie Madeline Whitman, Annette's sister. And we have uncredited uh, Walt Davis as Vladimir Wolfhart, Arturo, Norwegian archaeology student. Uh, Maria Basso, Elvira, Annette's aunt. So the aunt went from... Uh, 
let's see. Okay, yeah, so the ant went from... Oh, no, so the ant's Elvira still. Um, Adelie Taylor, Stefina, Bill's wife, same name. Uh, Alice Arno, Marie's Blanc. Okay, so now Alice, Alice Arno is in here as, of course, the Clara from the original cut. And then also uh, Marie's blonde lover in the mirror. Uh, Pamela Stanford makes an appearance as Marie's second blonde lover in the mirror. Ramiro Oliveras is Michael Rucca, theater director. Nicole Gutierrez, Miguel's assistant. Ramon Ardid, which is uh, Lena Romay's husband at the time, is Marie's male lover in the mirror. Uh, Francois Brion plays Tina. And Roger Sarbib is Roger Club pianist. Credits directed by Jess Franco, screenplay and adaptation by Jess Franco, screenplay collaborator Francois Brion, French Prince. Director of photography on this was Antonio Milon, Spanish Prince, Gerard Bressaud, and the French Prince. Um, music by Andre Benicio, French Prince. Music production, Andre Benicio. Uh, producers, Jose Maria Farquick and Francisco Gomez Reyes. And what else we got here we want to go with? Uh, how about camera operator Arturo Proyas, uh, makeup Adelia Del Pino, color Eastman Color, film stock Kodak, shot on Kodak Eastman Color for the French prints. Um, title, let's see, X sound recorders, Jean Panis, wardrobe, Cornejo from Madrid, and Ana Jorge from Lisbon. Our thanks to the Office of Tourism of Funchal for their collaboration during the shooting of this film. All right, so. Uh, I ended up, yeah, so, like, with this, the versions that we watched, or I watched, um, like I said, she watched the third version, I watched the third and the fourth cut, um, on this one, I'm gonna kind of go through some of the notes and things that are written, of course, uh, this comes from, um, Murderous Passions, The Delirious Cinema of Jesus Franco, Volume 1, by Stephen Thrower, yeah, Volume 1 and Volume 2 is, of course, the source material that we read from and research from every week. So, uh, yeah, keep buying those books on Amazon. Uh, volume 1 just came back up again. Uh, you can get it on American for about 30 bucks right now. It's a good deal. Uh, it goes up and down in price. So definitely some, put it on a, your watch list and check it out. Um, so, yeah, it says uh, he has for review... El, Otro Lado de Especio is a well-made, carefully elaborated tale about a young woman's inability to escape gnawing guilt after the suicide of her father. Although Franco directed it immediately after his irreverent machiste films, he shifts gears profoundly for the sorrowful exploration of familial and sexual dysfunction. Unfolding with tragic inevitability, the story boasts a standout performance from Emma Cohen, hairily expressive as a fragile child woman locked in a circuit of self-thwarting unhappiness whose visions of her dead father go hand in hand with the deaths of three men to whom she feels close. In the original Spanish version, this is a strange and ambiguous film, rather like Henry James' The Turn of the Screw, in that it's poised between a ghost story and a psychological case study. For much of the time, Anna's visions of her dead father seem to mirror throughout the film. Could be simply delusions. A supernatural interpretation is only compensated in the last five minutes when Anna Elvira sees the dead man and breaks the mirror to release Anna from his malefic influences. You could, I suppose, argue that Elvira is hallucinating too after receiving a disturbing phone call from Anna, but it would be a bit of a stretch. We've had no prior reason to think she's unstable. It's a shame in a way that the story opts for the ghostly explanation because it works so well as a portrait of the way guilt distorts human behavior. The visions occur when Anna gets close to other men and they act as a prelude to murder. The first comes when she's playing piano at a jazz bar. In a large mirror across the room, she sees her father hanging by the neck. As if drifting in a solopsistic haze, she traverses the mirror's edge, passing through a strange, darkened interior, and finding herself in daylight in a public park. Her current lover, Bill, is there too, and as if she's in a dream, she stabs him. Then, with a scream, she finds she's still on stage playing the piano. The situation recalls something Chet Baker once told Jess Franco about the way a musician can journey out of the room and into his own private world while improvising. For more on that, see Venus and Furs. Later, we learn that Bill was indeed stabbed in a nearby park, but what part did Anna play? Physically, she was nowhere near him. Was it perhaps a memory of something she did earlier that day? This, unus- this unsuited moment in which a violent traumatic event passes without explanation serves to destabilize the film's portrait of reality. 
Franco leaves the mystery unexplained, a decision which amplifies the illogical dreamlike nature of the story. As so often in Franco's work, a key theme here is incest. No doubt because the film was a Spanish co-production, the development of this idea is very subtle. We barely see father and daughter touch, much less get in bed with each other. Neither do we hear Anna or her father make overt statements of incestuous devotion or desire. On the surface, molestation does not take place. What causes the family catastrophe is Anna's decision to marry. Yet even this is handled cautiously. The arguments and jealous rages one might expect from her father are limited to a single tense exchange. When he hears that Anna wishes to marry, he demands that it be done quickly, as if washing his hands of the situation. His subsequent suicide comes out of the blue, the absence of a melodramatic confrontation or dialogue. Underlining the attraction between father and daughter throws emphasis on the symbolic. The suicide follows the daughter's decision to wed, the latter being a symbolic cutting of the ties of patriarchal control. The father's ghost appears in mirrors, but only as a hanged man, the image of his negation. All the terrible things Anna then does spring from her guilt at having reduced her father to this emasculated state of redundancy. A reflection without presence, an effect without a cause. No threatening spirit. He simply hangs there, a lingering reproach, a reminder that by deciding to marry, Anna turned her back on the unspoken romance between father and daughter. Anna responds to the suicide by canceling her marriage, and from here on, when other men get close, her attitude shifts from friendliness and vulnerability to nervous stiffness. Given the prevalent gender signifiers of the early 1970s, it's not much of a stretch to suppose that her problem with men is that she doesn't really desire them. Instead, the men with whom she sleeps are father surrogates. She can kill them with, without the guilt that would follow from a direct attack on the patriarch. Why does she need to do it? Where does this rage come from? The only possible explanation is abuse. The theme of incestuous abuse is poetically visualized when Anna has sex with people, an older man who's taken an interest in her. The two of them lie in bed together beside a window with a view of a lush Lisbon townscape. Above them, further up the hillside, is Anna's family home, overlooking everything from its lofty vantage point. Franco photographs the scene so that the reflection on the house in the bedroom window is superimposed over Anna's lovemaking, symbolizing the supernatural and psychological dimensions of her past. The final scene in which Anna returns to her family home are hauntingly sad. As she climbs the staircase to the front door, she stumbles, her movements clumsily and slowly, as though she's trapped in a nightmare and may never complete her journey. Psychological terms for drastic slowing down is a sign of repression, the psych trying to avoid confronting the truth of incestuous desire. By looking in the haunted mirror, Anna may come to face the feelings for her father, but when Elvira breaks the mirror, seeing the truth and erasing it, like the mother in an abusive household, possibly, she robs Anna of the cathartic confrontation. When the mirror is broken, Anna collapses on the staircase, and Franco, cut, Franco cuts to a shot of her as a child, walking through a garden hand-in-hand -hand with her father. Nothing in the body language is sinister, and yet surely what's implied is that the bond of love between father and daughter was corrupted at a young age, possibly. It would explain the father's bitter sense of ownership and his murderous rage and her inability to accept male love. On the other hand, you could say that the childhood image represents union after death, father and daughter together in a prolapsiarian paradise. The final shot sees Anna sprawled lifeless on the steps, bedecked in the wedding dress she only ever wore on the day it was delivered the day her father killed himself. Franco does not provide conclusive answers, preferring to end in an open poetic register that ensures this marvelous film lingers hauntingly in the mirror of your thoughts. Yeah, especially the uh, fourth cut, the one that I watched, which is like the first one on the other side of the mirror, that's, it definitely uh, registered with me and it's moved into like my top top ten Franco films that I've seen so far, maybe even top five. It's comparable to um, Christina, Princess of Eroticism. And like the other cut version of the Living Dead, which I still have yet to see because I just know it's not as good with the genre in uh, zombie footage. But, you know, that's like in my top five, too. So this definitely goes right up there with it. It's very similar. Uh, Frank on scene, Jess can be seen spotted briefly tickling the ivories on the jazz bar where Anna works. Um... Music. It's a case of swings and roundabouts when comparing the scores for On the Other Side of the Mirror or the French and Italian variants, El Otro Lado. Uh, begins with a light, almost childlike theme played languidly on piano of a student practicing. And several later scenes emphasize Anna's talent as a pianist by having her play complicated scales and arpeggios in the background. 
The main theme is a more of a piece for a phased organ, the cadence of which strongly resembles wind fields, wind, windmills of your mind. So yeah, it's best, basically two different soundtracks. French and Italian versions of the film feature excellent, though quite different music by Andre Benicio, with whom Franco became greatly enamored in 1974. His contributions replaced the coolness of the original score with haunting jazz rock featuring his characteristically smoothly guitar. Um, locations filmed in Funchal in Madeira and Lisbon. Studios Tobias in Lisbon. Uh, connections. The lead character is a jazz musician troubled by a specter from beyond the grave, echoing James Darren and Venus and Furs. The image of a father hanging by his neck is repeated from Virgin Among the Living Dead. Which I just said, it's funny. Uh, Anna is reading Heinrich Bohl's Das Brot der Frohan Jahr, The Bread of Those Early Years, a book about the struggle of the individual in wartime and the need for love. The drinking game that the characters play, called the King Edward Game, also pops up in Eugene in 1970. Okay, other versions. As so often, um, it wasn't long before co producer Robert de Nessel asked Franco for a sexier version of the film. He agreed to the request and created Le Mire Obscene, an ingenious, if only partially successful, reworking of the original material. Instead of Anna, renamed Annette, being dramatized by her father's suicide, Franco introduces a sister, Marie, played in the newly filmed inserts by Lena Romay. Annette and Marie have enjoyed an incestuous relationship since childhood. When Annette announces her forthcoming wedding... Marie is consumed by jealousy and commits suicide. Notice the way Franco immediately makes incest the clear and and definite focus of the story when free to do so. Though carefully editing and redubbing, Franco capes Annette's father alive long enough to set up the twist, after which all the versions of him and El Otro Lado de Especio are replaced by visions of Marie, entwined with various lovers demanding that her sister join her in death. Despite a few slip-ups here and there, including a less than satisfactory finale, the result is actually pretty good in its own right. Uh, the French version generally speeds up the pace of exposition, eliminating scenes, and clipping many others. While padding the film with sexual interludes, Franco's cunning redeployment of shots, his shooting of additional sex scenes, and careful redubbing of dialogue res- result in a second viable narrative from the same basic elements. Um, let's see. However, there is no doubt that the father, or that the film has greater emotional integrity in its original form. The father knowledge story is more convincing than the lesbian story. Um, partially, this is because we never see Cohen and Romay together. Cohen did not come back for the French reshoots, with, which seriously undercuts her supposedly intimate relationship. The lesbian theme in the mirror scene is not even fully sustained. Um, because, uh, yeah, if we're to believe that Marie's jealousy you'd think Franco would at least make her a full-on separatist. Instead, two of the scenes in the obscene mirror feature Romay having sex with Ramon are dead, which rather does sabotage the ending which Marie begs her sister to commit suicide in the name of sapphism. Interestingly, the mirror obscene includes material shot for the Spanish version but snipped by the censors. For instance, the murder of Miguel Michael is longer with a few more seconds of his reaction, plus an extra shot of him falling on the stage. Uh, Franco obviously experienced serious difficulties getting his work past the Spanish censor board. The stabbing we can see in the French version is by no means extreme, yet it was cut down to just a single shot in the Spanish edition. Le Mirab scene also includes several sequences of Emma Cohen undressed. For instance, we see her answer the phone in the nude. The Spanish version, she's photographed from the waist up wearing a bra. Likewise, the scene in which Annette remakes love to people incorporates topless shots of Cohen in the French version and coyly framed clothes shots in the Spanish version. In each of these cases, the more explicit material dates from the original shoot. Cohen did not return for additional filming. To make complicate to make matters more complicated, Le Mirab scene subsequently formed the basis of a third variant, which is the one we have, Le Spiccio del Pissieri, aimed at the Italian porn market. While it's similar to Le Mirab scene, it nevertheless trims a couple of vital scenes and leaves a major loose end hanging namely the fate of Annette's father, who disappears from the film after the first 15 minutes, whereas the mirror of scene included a scene in which Annette phones home and learns that her father had hung himself, thus making use of a primary image from El Otro de Especio and removing the last pillar of stability in the doomed heroine. Lespicio de Pesce disappears since with this detail and leaves the father mysteriously absent. 
It also drops a funeral service, skips past Annette leaving Madeira, and trims two minutes from the scene in which she reads from Michael's play. Um, it does, however, reinstate much of the romance with Pipo from The Other Side of the Mirror, although not the material newly discovered. Um, the speech of the Pissari also retains the entire scene in which Annette breaks off her wedding to our with Arthur, unlike the Barrett scene, which she dumps in with a few terse phrases. Most importantly, the speech of de Percy adds new material missing from both the French and Spanish cuts. Annette's attempted suicide is much more graphic. She's naked, and she slashes her wrist in clear view of the camera. She then climbs into the bath, and we get a lingering shot of her bloody wrist bleeding into the bath water. Incidentally, another echo of Venus and furs. And also, she killed in ecstasy. Um... This disturbing image appears in neither the Spanish nor French versions. Less vitally, the speech of the Pichia adds several hardcore penetration shots during the lovemaking scene between Annette and Pipo, and again during the final obscene mirror scene. There is also additional footage of Lena Romay and Alice Arno fooling around on the bed. This evidently dates from the Franco reshoot. However, close-up footage of a brunette performing cunnilingus on an unidentified vagina is then cut into Franco's reshoot material. In other words, an insert within an insert. Uh, these shots do not appear in the mirror scene and were probably not filmed by Franco. Similarly, Lena Romay's Sex in the Mirror with Ramon Ardet is intercut with new hardcore footage of penetration which is not present in the French version. Remember, Franco's 74 reshoot wasn't hardcore as such. It features shots of vaginal stimulation, a flaccid penis, and Ardet with his face pressed against Romay's vagina but no close-ups of full cunnilingus or penetration. There are numerous other small differences between the French and Italian versions and fans of the delectable Isles Arno would never forgive me if I neglected to mention that Lespicio di Pissieri includes an extra scene in which she lounges topless with Cohen, who sports a garish leopard skin bikini. Another change, small but regrettable, comes when Annette murders Pipo in El Otro Lado de Especio. Franco cuts from the bedroom killings to the poolside party, where Pipo's lover Carla nurses a drink. When Pipo dies, Carla turns around suddenly, as if someone were somehow aware of his passing. Both the mere obscene and Los Picho de Pissieri interfere with the editing of the sequence, losing the suggestion of a psychic link. Okay, now the fourth version, which is the one he talks about here that I've seen. Uh, in 2013, he was fortunate to see, the author was fortunate to see the pre-release screen of a new edit of the film running 109 minutes, an astounding 30 minutes longer than the original Spanish VHS. This rediscovered footage falls into two main categories, extended jazz improvisations, at the club where Anna works, and a generous extension of Anna's day out with Pipo, Tina, and Carla. Cohen's first performance of Madaria at the bar lasts two and a half minutes, in the VHS version nearly eight minutes in the new version. The second sequence in the bar, where from when Cohen walks out of the... from Cohen walking out with Woods after he kisses her to the piano piece where she sees her father in the mirror, lasts two minutes longer in the new version. There's an extra 20 seconds of nudity from Emma Cohen during the phone call from Bill, nearly one and a half minutes more material on stage at the start of the theater scene, including more of Miguel directing the actors on stage and a seated conversation with Anna in the stalls. Third jad club scene gains another minute or so. There is a 40-second more of Cohen wandering by the seafront, 30 seconds more of Cohen, Lamar, Arno, and Brian on the yacht, and driving around Fuchel in the opening topped car, and more strikingly, an extra six minutes with Brian, Cohen, and Lemaire spending the afternoon together, watching a singer in a bar, going for a walk, and chatting. Finally, the bedroom scene between Cohen and Lumiere is nearly two and a half minutes longer, including an extra topless shot during the sex. On the other hand, the semi of Miguel is missing in the extra shot seen in the Italian cut. Um, so what does the extra footage do for the film? For a start, the emphasis has shifted in favor of the soundtrack. This is another of Franco's love letters to jazz, a kissing cousin to Venus and Furs with the music given pride of place. The second effect is even more striking with his greatly extended day out for Anna, Pipo, Tina, and Carla. The film takes on a vivid existential quality. The longer version is dedicated evocation of the fragile pleasures of living, to enjoy lunch and drinks on holiday, to stroll with friends around a beautiful old town, to soak up the sun and sea and fresh air, and yet, beneath the dappled sunlight and the languor, laughter and gentle delirium of afternoon drinking, always the melancholy, a mirror key into the soul that will not go away. Some may find the longer version boring or frustrating, and it's true that nothing happens during the extended afternoon sequence. For me, though, it's an example of one of Franco's greatest yet lit celebrated skills. He transports you to a real day, a real time and place, amid the passing textures of existence, as though you've astral traveled through the window of his camera. He doesn't do this with any art movie uh, signposting. There's no song and dance made about it. But I somehow even doubt he knows what, he, what he's doing it. Self-consciousness would stem the window's 
would steam up the windows, clog the passage between here and there, and his folding of space-time occurs almost as a side product arising from his passion for the moment, his moment, the moment of filming. Lingering as he so often, lingering as he does so often on images that fascinate him, regardless of an audience in perspective of producers or the dictates of a plot, his fascination opens the door for us. Uh, press coverage. Uh, El Otro Lado de Especia received plaudits way beyond anything to which Franco was accustomed to in Spain. Emma Cohen received a prestigious Best Actress Award from the Spain's uh, Film Critics Circle, and one Spanish reviewer hailed a fascinating film in which beauty and emotion are played in a true display of skill. The plot is on a hallucinatory fantasy in the style of an American thriller in which terror and suspense alternate. The action takes place beyond the ordinary things of life. It falls squarely and the ultra-fantastic, and as an exploration of those areas beyond that the human mind cannot understand, the unsettling story of hallucinations and dramatic enigmas is told to us by Jess Franco through a genuine abundance of beautifully crafted shots, at the same time startling and amazing. As well as praising Cohen's performance, he singled out others in the cast, including the dynamic and brilliant Francois Brion, the great French actress born, however, in Venezuela, the effective and balanced Philippe Lemire, and the vigorous and expressive Romero Oliveros, one of the top leading men of Spanish cinema at the moment. Such with the enthusiasm that it seemed the door was being held open for a more conventional career in Spanish mainstream cinema. Franco, however, scarcely noticed. So, yeah, that's going to wrap up uh, the introduction and exposition of uh, this part of On the Other Side of the Mirror. Um, so, yeah, you can... Uh, Get us at FrancoObserver at Yahoo.com. Check us out on Instagram, on Facebook. we got pages there. Please download and subscribe to all the episodes and uh, rate and uh, tell all your friends about us too, please. would appreciate it. Keep building the audience and uh, let us keep going. So this is uh, episode 21. We'll have uh, bumper music. I haven't seen a trailer for this, so we'll go right into the review with myself and Miss Collie Sini from... Los Angeles, California. Have a great day. Hey, fellow Franco fans. Hello, buddies. This is your host, Jason Rudy from Desperate Visions Productions uh, from Sacramento, California. Uh, this is podcast episode number 21. And we are reviewing film number 53 from director Jess Franco. Uh, this week, I have a special guest, uh, first-timer on the show, uh, coming to us from Los Angeles, California. She's a fellow Francophile and has seen uh, over 50 of Jess Franco films. Uh, let's say hello to Miss Kali Sini. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> good, good, thanks. So, um, originally, when I had talked to you about picking a movie... Um, we talked about doing this film, um, the other side of the mirror or El Otro Lado del Especio, I guess the Spanish version. And, um, but I had tried known as the other side of the mirror and come to find out that you had only, uh, Lo Specio del Piacerci, <laughs> which is the, now I've come to find out the version number three, which is the, uh, so basically, there's the first version, which is the Spanish version, which has um, more Howard Vernon, and he's uh, the one that commits suicide and um, is seen in the mirror um, hanging from the rope, kind of like a Christina, Princess of Eroticism, or um, a Virgin Among the Living Dead with uh, Paul Mueller, you know, kind of the same effect. Nice. And uh, then in um, the obscene mirror, uh, it's Lena Romay in that part but in the third version it's uh her, her sister kills herself yeah it's her father yeah so the, she does that and then in the third version it's less scenes from the lena romay version but more footage from uh picho i guess or uh pico the older gentleman that she's with the third guy uh, there's more of that footage put in the third version that wasn't in the second version. Uh, yeah, so I'm sitting there going through as I've, because after I watched it, I was like, oh, shoot. And then I went through my versions, and I have the same as you. I have the third version and the first Spanish version, but I don't have the Italian version. 
So you have the French version, which I have, and the Spanish version. So, And then, come to find out, uh, the Spanish version I have, which is the first version, in 2013, they added more footage from the second version into the first version, more padded scenes, like <laughs> more nudity in that. So that's the longer version, and there's more scenes in the club of her singing and more jazz scenes, and you see Jess Franco twice at the piano, and there's actual complete song numbers that isn't in the third version that was pretty cool, too. That I was like, wow, and it's almost like a completely different movie. You know? Gosh, I wish we knew the motivations for why he would mess with it, because everybody that I've... Like, I mean, I don't know, all the people I've spoken to who have watched the original tend to say that it's their favorite and it's the best and the others are rubbish and don't even bother with them and all this. And I mean, I still like it, but, uh, but I, I mean, why, like, it's just so strange that he would, you know, like tinker with it after he'd made what everybody says is one of his best films. So, yeah, I mean, watching this, this automatically jumped in like my top five and I've only seen maybe maybe 40 Franco films, you know, but like this is right up there with Christina Prince's eroticism, um, which is kind of the same thing with um, a version of Mom the Living Dead. I haven't really watched that one, even though I've read about it and know all about it, because I just know it's not as good. So I'm like, why would I want to like take something I like and see a lesser version of it, you know? But on the other hand, too, there's people that dig that version because that was the first version they saw with all the zombie footage and stuff in it. And that was on VHS and this and that and stuff. And then you're always getting on good time with it, no matter what incarnation it is. It's just such a trip that with such a huge, you know, I mean, 174 films on Letterboxd, and I think there's more than that as well. And you're gonna start playing with one that you've already done really well. Like, just I, I, I wish we could ask. <laughs> so well, from what I've read and stuff, it's usually the producers. They want a sexier version. And so he'll go back and film like some some um, pickup shots of say Lena and another woman or something like he did with this. He had um because if you on the third version, um, Alice Arno gets the uh, top billing. If you watch it, uh, um, she's the first name listed, and she's like fifth or sixth down the line in characters in the film, you know. But she came back and did the pickup shots with Lena in the mirror and did some other stuff and. Uh, so, yeah, so she got top billing for this, which was odd watching that. That's the first thing I, I saw, you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely uh, interesting to, like, watch uh, the Howard Vernon one first and then watch the second one right after that and then deciding to, like, do this podcast. Like you said, sell me on the first film. Like, you know, what's what's the totally thing different that you got it? And that's one thing I would definitely say is that, like, it definitely – I mean, the third one is good, too. It's, it moves a lot faster than the first one, where the first one kind of takes its time, which I like a lot. It kind of shows you more things. And, and, but what's funny is the version I have, it's only about half subtitled. So half of their, their speech was only the text was coming up. So I was like, could it only follow it? But I enjoyed kind of knowing the feeling of it and kind of knowing the gist of it as well and not knowing everything they were saying. So... I like a nice Blu-ray of this to come out eventually. It's like a nice thing that has both for, or all, or even maybe all three versions if they can get away with putting the hardcore stuff on, on Blu-ray, you know, and get away with it. Yeah, but. especially considering how impossible it is to find that original version. I mean, well, you, you, you sent me a link to a Euro, Euro trash cinema thing that, where you can find it, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause maybe. that's where I get the DVD R's of that. Um, but now that, the image of the box that I got, uh, this one, uh, yeah. this was put out by that company. I think it's, uh, I believe it's a French release, and this was put out in 2014, and this is the He's longer, so but see, but it says Le Mer Obscene, so they're doing the Lean Rome version as their featured version, but then the disc two is the Spanish version one where Howard Vernon is in the mirror, you know. So this has both versions, but it doesn't have the third version, which you have as I have as well. And then the one I got from Trash Palace, which was this one that has the poster, it says the obscene mirror, but on the back it says Italian title Lo Specio del Piacere, which is the third version, not the second version, even though you buy this, you think it's the second one, but it's actually the third one, which you have, because that's the picture I took on my phone and sent you the front card, so... Yeah. So, I, so I don't have the obscene mirror as well. That's one thing I don't have, even though I have this as obscene yeah, mirror. mirror. 
in in the in the movie still is a symbol of death essentially that on the other side that's where the dead are and that's the whole you know that that seems to be the one thing that at least that's joining all the films and that like from what i can gather that you know it, it is just who's on the other side but someone's calling annette the whole time and trying to get you know her to 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 go join them and she even becomes death and it's kind of just like it's like the seduction of death of of uh, which, which seems to be the the main you know plot or you know the main cornerstone of it, whatever <laughs> of the whole uh, uh of all the all the three films so that would be the joining thing right yeah that and um the theme of incest actually because <laughs> and uh which is a really seen that's the thing too because like in in the first one with howard vernon um which is the, okay so in the third version you've seen they show the footage of him walking with the little girl and they say that's lena romay as a child okay and she says uh, my sister after she was born my father took more interest in her and they show the footage of supposed to be like years ago when she was a little girl and they show that shot well in the spanish original one um that is the lead actress and that's her and howard vernon and they show that scene quite a few more times and you realize that's her and her dad and stuff and you don't so then the voices that you hear in the original one of anna anna you don't know if it's if it's him calling out to her from the other side like a ghostly voice, or it could be his whisper that she has in her memory banks of maybe when he molested her or something and like his, his whispering in her ear, that's something she's always had her trigger response, like as a, as a thing with her, or it could be that the father in the mirror and she kills the man she's with because she has a father figure fascination and maybe he didn't molest her. Maybe she just thinks no man could lead up to her father and since her father killed himself on that day, and she always sees him hanging in the mirror as her guilt reminder, she can't form a relationship. So that's why uh, she uses that as the knife to kill the relationship she's with and kill the men, you know, in her father's memory. But in the version we have, the uh, you hear Lena Romay calling her out to telling her, hey, you need to kill the people, and, and she's more overt with it, and she's she's telling her to kill him, but the Howard Vernon one, he doesn't tell her to kill her. It's just, she just does that out of, of her own mind or whatever, you know? So yeah, it's really, really interpreting different. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, that's why it's really cool because it's like each film has its own read and its own line, you know, but they have very similar themes as well, you know, and they all yeah. play each other on, play on each other really, really well, I think, you know? But uh, yeah, no, it's it's definitely cool. And Alice, and, and there's scenes. So, all, for instance, too, the suicide scene with the lead uh, in the bathroom is completely different. And the first two are the same, and the third version is completely different. Um, where she cuts her wrist with the with the razor blade, um, which reminded me of um, she killed in ecstasy <laughs> when Soldad Miranda's husband killed himself in the in the bathroom as well. You know. But, uh, yeah, so she does it, and you see it a little bit. She comes to the bathtub. But in the third version, you see it much more graphically, and, she, and you see her cut her wrists, and she lays in the tub, and, and the blood flows up. And then the woman comes in and finds her. And that's a different shot because it's a different bathroom that they shot it into. So that was filmed right. later on, I believe. So, yeah, it was kind of cool seeing the differences. In the bath, and it was like – it was kind of a lovely moment for me. I felt very relaxed in my bath watching her bleed out in her bath. It was like <laughs> – I love Gus Frank going to bath. It's my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, no, I I usually watch him inside my dry room. So <laughs> I want a glass of wine because of all the you know the the weird cut ins of all the hardcore stuff is so funny because I mean it's uh, it, I don't know whenever I stare at it, it just it's it seems kind of campy to me whenever I watch all that because it's like they I mean I don't know if this is appropriate really to talk about on your your podcast but just it doesn't the, matter it's a frank <laughs> i mean the way that they actually do the the girl with girl sex it's right. it's not how you would normally do it <laughs> like it's like they don't even do it right like it, it doesn't seem that hard to be intuitive that you would want to go for the clitoris and they're always just like kind of licking around the area like and the woman's like making these sounds the wonderful voiceovers oh you know like she just loves it. and it's like 
you wouldn't be making those sounds for the for just that. Like you have to actually do the thing. But right. like, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, I know, it's, it's more the way it's photographed. Like, you know, because you're really, yeah. you know. And it's just like art, but it's not really. It's like they're pretending to have sex, even though you're actually watching them have sex. It, it, it's just so silly. And yeah, no, it's funny too. <laughs> With this film, one of the deals on my checklist is always um, Lena's magic tongue, and in this scene, you definitely have a uh, Lena's magic tongue in in this film. You know, right? But it's like licking the little flaps, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. She's not flaps, going in. It's not going like it's not touching the actual. <laughs> No, I know. And then the scenes with Lena and her husband at the time, um, Ramon are dead, and he's like totally flaccid, and, and you don't really, you know, he's not erect and she's not doing anything. But the other yeah, inserts yeah. later on, you do see that, and I don't know if it's him or they were inserts inside of the other inserts, which is really, really funny, you know. But my yeah. favorite part with all that whole insert stuff so was when the old lady well. saw it in the mirror at the end. That was the probably the funniest, I thought. Which ones? When you seen the old lady see all the uh, hardcore footage at the very end, I actually laughed out loud watching yeah. that because it was extended. That you see everything, the, the whole sequence, <laughs> and then that footage, and then the other stuff. It's like wow, and the old lady's just like you know. Yeah, that's that's surreal. Yeah, the the poor old little old lady in the mansion. <laughs> and it, yeah, the aunt, and in the original version, she is it's much more innocent because she sees a, a Howard Vernon um, a hanging there. And then she sees her, uh, his daughter, the lead, actually, you see her back from behind nude, and she approaches his hanging body and kind of hugs him. And then that's when she throws the cane at the mirror. So she sees that compared to all the hardcore stuff. That's why I was laughing. I was like, wow, this is completely different. Like, the lady shot the scene not knowing that this is what she was going to be uh, reacting to, you know. Then you see just right. p- insert shots and penetration shots and blowjob shots. I was like, wow, the old lady just stand there watching yeah. it for like five minutes. You know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I wonder if she ever even saw the final cut there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that third one came out in 1981. Uh, the original one came out in 76, and the Italian one, the second one, came out first in 75. So uh, yeah. checking all that whole dates of how it was. You know, she probably wasn't even alive anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we should talk about the jazz. I loved like how the soundtrack all throughout is so lovely. I want to know if the soundtrack in the original one is the same or different or same. You know, and here's the thing too, uh, reading about that and just also viewing it, uh, the first one is way more jazz. Uh, The first one is more reminiscent of um, Venus and Furs where you see the lead actress when she first leaves home to join the band. Okay, so... The version we have, uh, she meets with the trumpet player in the room first, and he tries to kiss her, and she says no and pushes him away. Well, in the original version, there's a whole four-minute sequence of her playing with the band before that happens, and that's after their performance. So that cuts that whole scene out. And, uh, yeah, and it's really good. And those are the same group that's at the party later on and in the bar with the guy's wife and everything. And uh that, that thing he he tries to kiss her and tries and she says no like a hundred times and he's until she finally has to like shove him off and go away and then the next time they hang out it's like everything's cool and now like then a few minutes later he's like professing his love to her in a way that like no guy i've never heard a guy profess love like that you know and it's like wait you just like we're trying to like it pretty much attack her and now you're like my life has meaning with you and it's just yeah whole- it's yeah because in that second version or because in the version you've seen the third version that whole sequence like i said is totally streamlined that that performance is cut out after she pushes him away she goes out and you see jess franco again play piano and that's in the version you have and then it goes to oh you see jess in it yeah, Jess is in the third version, and because the, the first version he's in it twice, but in the X, the triple X one that we have, the third version he's in it just once. He's on the piano when she's sitting there watching him after she pushes Bill away and goes back, and she's smoking, watching the performance. That's Jess Franco with the white shirt on, playing piano with the kind of long hair, glasses. Huh. I yeah, mean, he, I always just saw, you know, I, I guess I didn't catch that. Was I usually always catch jazz. I yeah, love he's a piano, piano player in, in oh, bar scenes. I mean, she was that. playing the piano most of the time. And I was, yeah, I, I thought she was the one playing the piano. I didn't Yeah, no, but there's a scene where she's sitting there smoking and she's watching it and the guy behind her kind of taps her on the shoulder and says, hey, 
you're going up next. And then she goes up and, and then does her second number, which is really edited in, in, in the triple X version, that whole sequence. And it pans from the trumpet player to the sax player and all those other things. Then the sax player also plays a, a xylophone and that's all cut out. And so that whole sequence is about six minutes shorter in the, in the, in the other version. So he goes into that. And also too, the music is different. So that uses more of a jazz and then on the, triple x version he uses a different musician that does kind of more jazz rock that kind of goes up into the other scenes that aren't on stage you know like some of the stuff at their house when they're kissing and doing stuff and then in the beginning and stuff too some of that more jazzy kind of rock stuff is is different in that third version so yeah so it's it's cool i mean i prefer the first one because it's more laid back and it flows better but the third one's cool too because it's it's shorter, so it's faster music, so it makes sense because it's a quicker pace, you know. So I think it fits. Both Both are actually really cool, so it's it's definitely not a loss to have either or, you know. But, yeah, but, uh, but, yeah, but the first version also has uh, a lot of the sequence where uh, the lead, Anna, she goes out with the older man and his wife, and they go to another piano bar that's totally cut out of the third version, and there's like a famous um, piano player in there I talked about who – had done tons of soundtracks that Frank liked. And there's that whole sequence where he's playing. And then the older guy comes up and talks to the, talk to the other older guy. And then he's a piano player in the third bar that we see later on when you see the bunch of couples dancing and it's like in a different upper scale kind of piano bar with glass, glass uh, walls. And then he's an older guy playing a piano. You see him in another scene that's cut out in the first version where he talks to the main um, people guy, you know, and they have a conversation and he introduces himself and he's kissing everybody and stuff. That whole thing is totally cut out, you know? And then in the X-rated version too, they have more of a dialogue with the people and his wife trying to have a threesome with the lead. And in the Spanish one, it's more like he kind of likes her and he's ignoring the wife. And they, so they change some of the voiceover and dialogue to like change that theme too. So, so yeah, it's totally different. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fucking cool, you know? Um, yeah. It's interesting how you can make so many different reiterations. But yeah, yeah I, one little thing that I caught that was kind of cool was that um, he, the director that she murders, one of her several murders, um, uh, she, he was uh, supposed to have been directing the myth of Medea at the time. Yeah. And she's the goddess of prophecy. So I thought that was a cute little wink there. He had to like work in his Greek, you know, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up because I just thought it was cool because I love Greek mythology. And I was like, Oh, I see you. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally dug that. I'm glad you brought that up because there's a cool shot. And actually it's a little bit longer in the original version, of course, just like everything. But in that one, when she, before she stabs him, she shows up in the top rafter, and and he's sitting there in the longer version. He has that spotlight, and he's kind of going around the rooms. And then you see her for about two frames, and then he turns the light to her, and she's gone, almost like she's a ghost because she's all in that white kind of gown, you know. And then he keeps moving the light, and then she comes in. He goes, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And then she walks in, and then, you know, she comes to the stage and stabs him. But in this one, it's almost like she's a ghost, like she doesn't exist, which is kind of cool because – she in the end when she's in her wedding dress that's the whole white as well and then and now she's wearing the whole white and going through and, and doing everything so but uh yeah it's cool you don't really know if she really murdered the people or if it's in her brain or what's I really really cool somewhere else at the time so it's like how like it's like her spirit is doing it i don't even know like what you know just land but because uh, i mean she was supposed to have been playing piano when you know that she first stabbed that dude in the garden or whatever and you know, but I mean, it's, it, it, but the thing is, is every time right before she, you know, kills someone and they say, you're so cold, you're not yourself, you're so cold, which is to say that she's dead. And it's like her, you know, she's like her, her dead spirit or I don't know, or, or death is like maybe killing through her, you know, like the, the sister telling her to go or the, you know, or the, the mourning of her father and all that, but just whatever she, she becomes like a, she becomes death, you know, it's kind of a, well, don't, it, it's cool too because one of his themes is a uh, mind control, and just as we're talking about this, I just kind of thought about that. How this is mind control? How you talk about her being so cold, and she's like doesn't remember what happens, like in Voodoo Passion and other things. They kill, and they don't remember. What well, I don't remember that, and then the whole you know trying to play it off and stuff. But uh, what was funny is the older guy, the third couple, um, Peepo, him and his wife. He reminded me of a role that a, a Jack Taylor might have played if he was in the movie. You know who Jack Taylor is? I. 
probably would by sight. He's in like a bunch of the Franco stuff. He's in like female vampire. He has the big like handlebar mustache. A uh, real skinny guy. He's in, uh, yeah, he's a female vampire. He's in Voodoo Passion. He's in, uh, I think he might be in 99 Women. He's in like tons of Frank. He's probably in about 15 Franco films. He's in Count Dracula. He's in, uh, I believe she killed an ecstasy. And yeah, yeah vampire Liz so. I, I know. <laughs> if you saw his face, yeah, you'd be like, oh yeah, duh. I totally know that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in quite a few Franco stuff. But yeah, he, that guy reminded me of that. Um Vernon, though, you know, his face just takes everything over so that I, that's kind of the only face that you can see because he's such, such a, you know, googly eyed freak. He's, he's an amazing looking. Yeah, since I got into the Frank, so like my my trip is like Franco films, I was never really a huge fan of. I liked a few of the Fu Manchu stuff originally because I liked Christopher Lee and I liked the horror stuff and I kind of got into his stuff. But like, I jumped into hardcore into Franco probably the last two years. I mean, I like to start buying all this stuff and just, I don't know, something bit me and I just like started like collecting all of his films and then I built my collection and then started watching a lot of these for the first time and reviewing them, kind of doing some research and kind of wanting to watch them with fresh eyes too and not knowing a lot. Like this film that we watched or that you and I watched this time, uh, I've always seen pictures of this and I, and I just knew that I've always wanted to. And I was like, this film just looks like I would really like it. The colors, the pictures I've seen, and and it just and its theme just really really struck me. And I was it was one one that I've always really really wanted to watch. So I sat down and got this morning about five a.m. and watched both of them back to back. It's kind of a cool way to start my day, you know. So I yeah, uh, to, to, yeah. but yeah, but going back to Howard Vernon, yeah, since I got into that Franco stuff, Howard Vernon now is quickly becoming one of my favorite actors. I, I love Howard Vernon. He is so much like Boris Karloff, and I'm a big Boris Karloff fan. Speaking of Dr. Fu Manchu, and uh, so yeah, his eyes and, and the way he carries himself and being real thin and total gentleman, but, you know, plays the monsters, can play the mad scientists and play okay. a total scholar guy. And it's amazing. Very, very cool. Work so many different roles with his unique look and his unique <laughs> But he can, yeah. he can become a monster and he can also be a total gentleman. And all that. So, yeah. yeah, it's cool to see him like, you know, being with women and then also just like being a scary monster too. You're like, wow, it's cool. You have a good range. You're not just one thing. And I always love when a director and an actor do multiple films together over the years. And you can see that partnership, you know, with the comic Laughlin and David Lynch or, you know, Franco and Howard Vernon or, you know, Mark Scorsese and De Niro, whoever, you know. Love how Jess has this regular. I mean, I'm a huge Lena Romney fan. Like I, just absolutely love her. I, I mean, I listened to your uh, podcast with Amber, of course, and uh, uh, you're talking about Soledad, and everybody is always like, she is the most beautiful woman to have ever existed. And, I mean, I'll give you, like, she's absolutely stunning and gorgeous. She does have a certain thing, but there's, I love Lena for, like, her, she's just so wild and silly, and, like, she doesn't have any fear at all, and she just will do anything, and she will she has no no shame. It's so beautiful. She just wants to sleep with everyone on earth and just delight in it. And she's just, I don't know. I just love her, everything about the way that she, I just, I really adore Lena. You know, I, I just, I, 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 I get all verklempt when I think about her and Jess as a couple. I think they're like the coolest couple to ever couple. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and it's sad that, like, Franco's wife was a script supervisor and they were a team, too, and that kind of they kind of had to break up that team in, in order to have Lena and him be a team. And then she was with, you know, um, Ramon Ardid, and they were a cool couple and kind of, like, had that whole thing. But, yeah, in the end, they were a cool team. And, and as they got older, it was really cool to see how they, they just and, – and also, too, like, as a filmmaker, I always tell my friend Eric, I said – Lena Romay is the ultimate actress, the ultimate actor, the person to have. She will give you everything you want. She'll jump out of a fucking off a off of a off of a wall naked, jump down trees. She'll have sex with five guys, two women. She'll fight a fucking monster. She'll do whatever you want. She'll go outside naked at you know two degree temperature. She she she's she's gung ho. Like you said, so she's totally fearless. Over other people having sex, like I just I love her. Yeah. Everything I've seen her do, I'm just like, what? Like I, I why can't I live your life? You're so you're just doing it like full throttle. Go go you. I just I love Lena. Actually, we should also talk about the fashion in the 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 show because I yeah. I mean. I don't know. I, I wanted to hear how the other film was, but I mean, you know, just like that color block caftan when she was like 
you know, with oh, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the uh, rainbow one at the end that she was wearing. She went like on this really sad descent with the men. It was like first she had like this really sweet, wonderful guy from Norway who was like completely like love means so much to me and I love you and we're going to have a beautiful life. And then he's, she's with the dude who like was going to attack her. And then you know, like she's yeah. in the director and then she's with this old dude. Like, it's just, why are you like you like, and she looks like Charlotte Gainsbourg or something. I mean, she's just gorgeous. Like she just has this, I really like this actress and I wish she was in more stuff. Like, I don't know. I, I just love her. And so, yeah, I loved everything she was wearing though, too. <laughs> it's just the whole time, like work, you know, and the guys even had great outfits. Like the, the dude in the park with the jacket was like, I don't know. All of it was so fly. The yeah, whole- no. It, well, yeah. <laughs> that, a trumpet player, Bill, that you're talking about, uh, they extended yeah. uh, uh, scenes Bill's in the Bill. club where they play. Bill. He's wearing this cool vintage Captain America shirt that you really can't see in the triple X oh, version. But yeah, it's a really cool that. Captain America shirt with this cool Not funky even. necklace. Um, yeah, the whole <laughs> band, of course, was cool. Jess Franco's wearing this cool fucking shirt. And he's got scraggly hair. Um, the lead actress you're talking about, um, um, Emma Cohen, uh, I was reading after the original version came out, she got an award in Spain as like, uh, best lead actress for like their Academy Awards over there, and and, oh, wow. and people really took. I'll have to look up what else she's been in because I I really I don't know. Yeah, watching her again, seeing it, re- revisiting this movie, I was like, God, she's really something. I don't know. I mean, yeah. she's you know like next to the 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 energy of of Lena and Soldad, like you know you you kind of she fades, but like then when you kind of give her a chance, it's like oh she's actually really enchanting and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I like it was cool because like watching the original version, the Spanish one, I was thinking this is almost like a European um, Woody Allen film, like with all the couples and the kind of uh, infidelity with the older couple and the young woman coming in and and with the extended jazz music that you don't see in that third version. And then with like them doing a lot of the dancing and then, you know, talking about life passing them by and how this young woman's free. And, and so a lot of that was very similar without the comedy, but just the actual kind of like the um, – Hannah and her sisters or a crimes and misdemeanor, something like that, where it was like an older adult contemporary romance story or whatever in those parts. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely had that feel of that first one. Um, but uh, in the third one, it's, it's more excised, you know, and stuff, but also to the fashion, the cool tuxedo that she wears in that last scene is like really, really cool. Oh yeah. 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 It, it's yeah. Everything is just, I don't know. I'm always gushing at all of that. I wish we lived in more uh, fashionable times. I don't know. <laughs> and then, of course, too, uh, of course, me wearing my uh, Bruce Lee thing here. Uh, her with the wedding dress at the end, too, like a, a Kill Bill, too. I was kind of think watching that, you know, and that flashed in my head, too, of that sequence, you know. Yeah, that's funny. You do look like a Kill Bill. Thing. Yeah, I know. I was, worried. I was laughing about that. I was like, oh, yeah, duh, you know. But that's also in. Uh, Bahia Blanca, where she's in the wedding dress with a, a machine gun oh, on the cover of that. So Bahia Blanca is like one of my, I just, that, it's, it's such a beautiful dream on the beach. I love his whole beat. Oh yeah. You were saying in your thing, how uh, I've listened to your other you know podcasts and you were saying like how you're always looking for a boat and there's like these certain things that you kind of always can yeah. see. Totally, I was, totally. I was trying to find the sheepskin rug this time. It didn't though. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think the sheepskin rug is more in the Irwin C. Dietrich ones because that's part of his studio. So like in those 12 films, that's where I was figuring out like that's that was part of his deal, like his on set Uh, stuff. So when they go off location from that location, the sheepskin rug disappears. But there's always different phases. And and the more the more Franco I watch, the more new things I see, like a new thing that I've added recently to a list that hasn't been on a podcast yet, but it's already been recorded because I'm like five episodes always, you know, ahead of time. Uh, is the chained up woman. There's always a chained up woman. But in this film, I don't think there's a chained up woman at all, except yeah. maybe chained in the mind, but not physically, you know, chained up. No yeah. thing. Mentally chained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chained in the mirror. mirror. So, yeah, so, so since you bring up the checklist, uh, yeah, so on this, uh, he always usually starts off, this one he didn't start off, but there's definitely a, uh, a body of water and uh, a sailboats in this. There's quite a few boats. Uh, even in the shorter version, she's on the boat at the end, but there's other shots where you see a lot of boats uh, in about three or four different sequences um, throughout the film. Um, 
um, a dance sequence in a club. Yeah, there's couples dancing in the piano bar. In the third version, a little bit, but in the first version, there's two or three scenes where you see couples actually dancing when people are playing piano. When she plays the piano, there's uh, everybody just kind of sits and watches. But when they go out to the two other clubs, uh, and there's a younger guy playing the piano, and then the older guy in the third scene, uh, they're all doing the ballroom dancing and all the yeah. dancing with the club. So I count that as a dance scene in the club. I love that he loves dancing. I love dancing. Yeah, so dancing is funny. I there's always dancing. things. <laughs> Remember the world when you could go dance with people? Oh, I know. And that dancing is, is like a, is, is always a nice thing to photograph. I mean, it's always interesting to watch. And I was like thinking about why he always filmed that. It's like people enjoy watching people having a good time. And it's always a positive thing, you know. It can be funny. You feel like it can be sad there. or whatever. Yeah, you you join the party that way. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and it's, it, always, it helps me during this whole quarantine thing to watch people dancing. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of a cool way. You kind of like go through and you start figuring out things, and you go, okay, you know, you kind of place it all together in its context. Um, sheepskin rug, of course, we talked about Noto and none of that. Um, palm trees, yeah. There's there's some nice uh, uh, palm trees. Like in in the first version, you see more than this one. Um, and there's actually like kind of bird sound effects when they go to the house. They do the first pan to the house in the first version. But in the triple X version, I noticed I it's a lot it. shorter. I'm sorry. Can you say again? I, I, I just said I love that you noticed the bird sound effects. That's, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that, he, that makes like a conscious choice to have bird sound effects. That's, that's like you got to get some birds in there. You can just see them, in, you know, like in the cutting room. Like make sure to toss some birds in there. Yeah, they always – I think they just have like his sound effects <laughs> bank and he just puts it in over the bed and just has it. But, but what's great is later on like in the 80s or actually even in uh, White Skin, Black Thighs – he does it, and then I think, and then after that, in the eighties, there's a few where he starts voicing the birds on in scenes, where if a parrot talks, it's usually Jess Franco's voice. He's like, ah, "I saw him do it! I saw him do it!" You know, and it's like Jess Franco. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, "Oh shit, that's Jess Franco!" You know, because you can totally hear yeah. him in interviews talking and stuff. And oh my gosh, what was the movie where they? Yeah, it was like the parrot was the one that kind of saved Lena when she was like hiding in the trees, and the, like he he told her like she went that way or something like that. Yeah, yeah that was barbed wire dolls, I think, or, or yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was that one where the bird like snitches on her. Yeah, and that's just Franco doing the voice of that bird. It's just fucking funny. Love it. You know? <laughs> yeah, so that's always a cute thing. Um, and then yeah, and then also, and then uh, with the Irwin C. Dietrich ones. Uh, I always have a masturbation with a C item. Usually he does, in that one, they did a champagne bottle, a candle. I've seen him do a cucumber, uh, the uh, hand shape is a claw. Item. When you said C item, I thought you meant from the ocean, and I was like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, of the letter C, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was picturing octopuses, of course. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I, Crustaceans. I missed that, that one. I, haven't, I need to see that, Jess. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, in the Urban C. Dietrichs one, there's always a masturbation scene with the uh, article with the letter C. And lately, <laughs> I, I had this theory that maybe it was because it was with um, Irwin C. Dietrich. So maybe it was because of the C in his name. I don't know. It was like maybe an inside joke that he did, or maybe it was a subconscious thing. Or maybe it was like 32 or 237 now. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> I'm seeing, I, I, I see a pattern here. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. That's why I'm like, digging this. Like watching these as an observer, you like, okay, you like take notes and then you put your notes together and you form a thesis and you start seeing patterns and chart your patterns and you go over your notes and you're like, okay, I'm seeing this, this, and this. And you know, it's kind of fun. You, you know? with items with the letters C. I love it. That's <laughs> wow. and, and then um, red lights. He always has a scene with a red light. Um, in this one, uh, yeah, there was red. I mean, yeah, um, and the Lena scenes especially, the flashback scenes where she's on the bed, that whole thing was kind of lit very red, you know, with the red yeah, red totally. bedspread and the red kind of all around her when Alice Arno comes in in that. Um, it's good for sexy times. Yeah, and then, of course, uh, Chained Up Woman, no. Um, Lena's Magic Tongue, yes. Definitely Lena's Magic <laughs> Tongue was in the third version. Um, a lot of it, too. A whole lot of it. Now, also Zooms. Now, Franco's usually kind of judged on his amount of Zooms or, or having things out of focus. With th this film, there's a few Zooms, nothing too Zoom crazy, but some <laughs> of the focusing was kind of funny when there's a scene where uh, 
the lead's walking down the hallway toward the mirror, and he shows Lena and the other girl in the mirror, and then he spins the camera all the way around to the to the two women on the bed, and he kind of like tries to get it in focus when Lena's underneath Alice with her face, and you see him kind of like get focus really well, <laughs> and that was kind of laughing about. It's like he could have cut and got it in focus, and then put it together, use a different angle or something, but you know. Yeah, toward the end, there was a, a scene I, I, I giggled out where, you know, they were, it, he, she was standing there and it was, they were, you know, he, he was going to take a picture of her and then she takes her shirt off. And instead of kind of showing her with her breasts, he just zooms in on the breasts like a complete creep, which. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where she's up against the window. Yeah. <laughs> she's just like standing there trying to, you know, have her moment. And he's just like boobies. He can't even help himself. Now, now see that last sequence where she's on the bed by the window, that is so beautiful because he frames the house of her youth in the shot on the reflection of the window above her when she's in bed. So when she's in bed with the older man at the end, it takes more resonance with the first film because it could be like her father, like the older man on top of her under the reflection looking at her her house of her youth. That that tracks more with like that tale. I didn't really go with this one, but but yeah, that makes sense that she would start looking for daddy. Yeah, plus the reflection is always upon her. I mean, and it's like the more you read it, the more as you say it out, you're like, oh shit, you know, it's very, you know, psychological in the terms of, yeah, the reflection of her past is always above her when she's in bed with another man. You know, and it's like, uh, you know, it's like, so that part's kind of cool, all that. And it's really, really intelligent with that whole, the way he sets it up. And that's one thing I liked about this as well is that it's very psychological and, and with the original version, more of a ghost story. And, you know, that's one thing, too, uh, Stephen Thor talks about in the Flowers of Perversion book, and I agree, too, is, like, in the end, you kind of wish that the mirror wasn't haunted and it was more of a psychological thing with her and that there really wasn't a ghost in the mirror where it's – you don't know if there was or not. And it's more your interpretation, you know, compared to where the old woman sees it and then smashes it. So you could say, well, you know, once it smashed the mirror, then it's destroyed or it could be more of a symbolic thing. But the old woman could also just have a hallucination because the man's wife called her frantically saying, your, your niece killed, killed my husband and she's fleeing to your house. And then she, the old woman sees all that in the mirror as well for the first time and destroys the mirror. But if she didn't see that, then it might take on a different theme, you know, if the old woman didn't see that at the very end. I mean, I had kind of perceived it that it was just all in her head, but, you know, that, 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 that was just what the mirror symbolized to her. It was a, there was just this beyond, you know, the beyond or whatever that you, you know, and, and that's, you know, the doorway to it is mirrors. It's a, such a trippy thing. So um, Yeah, and that's cool that you mentioned that because I, 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 I more saw it as like the ghost and them calling out from the other side, but I didn't really think about the beyond like that, which is the lyrical sense and how the beyond is one of my favorite films as well. And it's cool that <laughs> you have that sense of, and then there's a scene where she kind of walks toward the mirror and then you see the camera shows you from the other side of the mirror like she's kind of went, walked through the mirror to join Lena or join her father or whoever the object is that she's going through the mirror to, you know, like she stepped yeah. through that part. Kind of like, too, with Virgin Long Living Dead or Christina that right in the end, you know, she goes to the house and everybody's dead, and but she doesn't know it yet. And then she finally joins them at the end where she steps through that final passage and goes off to the other world, you know. Yeah, but, uh, and then at Howard Vernon as well, leading her in, which is kind of cool. Yeah, you gotta see that original one. <laughs> it's so funny that I'm on a show to talk with you about a film, <laughs> a film that I haven't seen. Well, no, I that's mean, I, but that, but but you've seen one of the three of this film, which is the whole thing. Because I've seen two of the three, but just doing the research of it, it's just you know you just kind of like learn it. So and it's cool because with this episode people are going to learn now that there's three versions of this one film if they don't know it already or they might know it or might be confused or might only know of one or didn't know these other two exist. I mean, before this, I thought there was two versions. I didn't know there was literally now four technical cuts of it. The Spanish one, the extended Spanish one I have now, the second one I don't have, and the third one I have, which you have. <laughs> it's trippy, you know? And that's like a mirror. It's like mini mirrors like this film, you know? <laughs> and also, too, Franco has a thing with... Um, Mirror shots. That's another thing that's that's added on the list. And of course, this movie has tons of mirror shots. Of course, the mirrors of the people coming through, 
uh, the guy in the convertible, he uh, looks at the mirror quite a bit in the first cut. And there's always, you see them always looking up at mirrors in quite a few of the rooms, you know, and Franco likes yeah. to shoot the reflection off the mirrors, you know, that's always a really nice touch. And he uses a lot of fishbowl shots. And in this, there's like two fishbowl shots. Yeah. I was just thinking for nothing associated with what you're talking about, but just that the one part of the movie that I don't know, I caught me was like, it, it's a silly little bit, but I wonder why they even put it in there. But it was just, um, remember Gloria, the like, um, the gorgeous black chick uh, with the giant fro. And she yeah. was like, Bill's I love wife. you. You're the only one. For, that was his wife. That's his wife. The woman that was behind the bar. <laughs> yeah. And the first, ver- the first version. Okay. Cause I was yeah. like, who- why, why is this happening? Like, cause it, all they show is just the one scene in the movie I watched where she's just like, don't go. I love you. You're the only one for me. And he's just like, fuck off. Like I, you know, I'm with this chick now I'm with Annette now. <laughs> and I mean, he didn't even tell her he was with Annette, but he, that was basically his thing. He just like was, and she was this gorgeous woman and hanging and begging. And, oh yeah. And, oh, I know. There's scene where she's laying upside down in the party. And she's beautiful. That sucks. <laughs> anyway, if we're going to go party. <laughs> Yeah, and then you see her again in that third version as well uh, when uh, the lead comes back to the bar and finds out that he's been stabbed or was killed. She's uh, standing behind the bar because she's the bartender too. And you see her oh. in there when she's when she's just standing there for a brief thing. She says, yeah, he was stabbed uh, by a, some madman. And then she has a drink. She's kind of drunk, just kind of standing there because he was killed, you know. Yeah, and in that version, they talk about it a little bit. He says that's his wife and that she's always drunk, he says about her at the party. But in the first version, they have – a couple more conversations and then uh and then the the lead asks the husband like what's up with her and she says well that's my wife and we have this kind of relationship and she's always drunk and and she's always flirting with other people so i'm okay to like go out and talk to you and do stuff you know kind of like she has with the third you know um couple as well you know so she has that same kind of pattern that she keeps running through you know except for the second guy the theater director who's totally different you know yeah. Yeah, she seems to get with these couples. Yeah, really good it's amazing how she just can like bounce from dude to dude. It's like she told that guy, I'm not in love with you anymore later. And then she, you know, she, uh, you call it, uh, you know, moves on to like the, another, the other dude, like two minutes later. It's just, I don't know. After like your sister dies or, you know, or your father, I mean, come up for air for a minute. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It's just like on that game, and and every guy is just like you are. I'm in love with you. Like every every single guy, just as soon as they meet her, they're like, I love you. Yeah, they're you fascinated know? by her. Yeah, it, it's just I don't know. It's like that'd be a, it, it's kind of fun to watch his movies because you just imagine like, what if the world was like that, where like a guy met you and was like, I love you. It's, that never happens. <laughs> but yeah. So let me think. Any other notes on this? I'm thinking of. Um... Let's see. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of the scenes. Um, Alice Arno's top build um, on the third version. You have um, the version with Vernon and the kid are now of uh, Lena and the father instead. Uh, you have um, – it's funny. You have Lena with Vernon uh, seen talking, and then you cut to the hardcore insert shots of Lena thinking back to her and her sister, which I thought was kind of funny, kind of jarring, where Lena's sitting with her dad talking to her about uh, – I'm sorry. Yeah, I are talking to her and about the sister going off to get married, and then she's having the flashback thoughts about her and her sister having sex when she's talking to her dad. I was like, that was kind of more yeah. X-rated, you know? Um, yeah. And then it's funny. So, so in this version, it seems like um, <laughs> it seems like Lena stabbed herself with like a giant sword, but then I thought it was that small knife that the lead used all the time to stab the other people. I don't know. I. Was, I don't know. I thought it was more of a dagger. I guess I didn't like focus too much on it, but I, yeah, I, I thought it was more of a dagger. I don't know. I thought it was the same one. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I'll have to watch it again. Maybe it was just the shadow of her holding the dagger up. It looked like it was a longer sword oh, or right. something. Yeah. You know? But yeah, it probably is because that makes sense. Oh, and also, too, in the version, uh, the original version, when she kills uh, the theater director, when she picks up the dagger, in the original version, it's first. Um, a fish that's kind of squirming it's like so when she's an actress she's a uh she's a uh, uh, fish out of water so the fish out of water turns into a knife and then she grabs the knife and then sta- and then visits the theater director 
That's so wonky. Yeah, it's a totally it's trippy song. Too that they do say after that first one that he she he was killed by a antique uh, weapon or something like that. They right. call it like an antique weapon, which means they must have recovered it. But then she goes on to have it for the, all the next murders somehow magically, even though she was just wearing a you know nightgown. So yeah, it's I mean she's obviously like some kind of Grim Reaper or something. Yeah, because she's with the old man at the end. That knife appears again on the on the nightstand uh, next to the bed, and then she you know reaches and stabs him with that knife. You know, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, so in the lead. Um, um, Anna is her name in the original version, and it's um, Annette in the third version. Um, and uh, yeah, so then you have also Franco is only in the piano one time on this, which I had said before, instead of uh, twice. Um, a lot of the club scenes are different. You have um, Lena with Ramon Ardid, all those scenes. The suicide scene, of course, is different, different bathroom, different house, different angles, actually, the whole thing's a totally different setup. Um, and uh, well, and also too, what's cool is there's that scene in the third one of Lena, uh, Lena Romay talking to Howard Vernon uh, when her sister is going off to get married, which I talked about. And that scene, of course, is not in the original version. So I wonder if they brought Howard Vernon back. I assume uh, to do that reshoot with 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 Lena and that, and some of those extra scenes, you know, hmm. with her doing that whole thing. Because uh, and what's weird is in the third version now, the extracted one. Howard Vernon kind of like disappears after like the first 15 minutes. You don't really hear from him anything. Yeah. And in the original one, of course he dies. And then in the uh, second one, uh, she finds out that he dies via a phone call from the aunt calls him and says, Hey, your father killed himself, you know, later on. And that makes her further unstable, even though uh, Lena is still the one calling out to her, you know, which kind of makes it more in line so, of she's, she's like losing her marbles more and more, you know, or, or oh, whatever, that. you know. Yeah. So is there, I mean, I, I figure there's more Vernon flashbacks in the first one. And so you see him more in the first one. Like, throughout yeah, the- you see the flashbacks of him walking with her as a daughter, a couple park shots. And then you see uh, more of like him at his desk writing. He has this big, uh, kind of a Catholic thing above his desk. Like, I think that's in this version too. It's like, it opens up and it's they're like statues and like paintings of like clouds and kind of Catholic imagery, I believe and the little like altar above his desk, which is kind of cool. That's almost like a Dr. Orloff thing where he got into Catholic Catholicism later on, you know, and then of course, same actor. So I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Maybe he was maybe a Catholic person in real life. I'm not sure. I know Franco always didn't like Catholic. So that was his thing, you know, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I loved making fun of them. So yeah, but it also like would would uh, help her psychosis, you know, with her whole like for her. I mean, because it's really messed up that like she tells her dad that she's going to get married, and so he kills himself over it. Like, like yeah. that's so like what a jerk. You know what I mean? Like God, like be happy for your daughter, and it's like I don't know, just it's so like that's so incredibly like cruel. And but then like you know if if you have the whole religion like hang up as well then you know she's gonna feel the whole guilt shame remorse that whole the the whole guilt shame thing that, that right. the Catholics do so well then yeah <laughs> you know then then that'll play into it she'll she'll say fault instead of thinking that you know well he had some issues then she'll think it's her fault and you know, internalize it as as one does when they are. My yeah, Lord. so like, yeah, there's definitely more of a scene with Howard Vernon and her in the beginning when she's telling him she's going to go off to get married and stuff, and he, and he reacts so suddenly. That's what makes you think that maybe they had more of a different relationship than more of a father daughter, more of like a incestuous relationship, or he, or he right. abused her when she was a when she was a child, of course, with the voices and that. So it's all into your interpretation of it, but with him reacting so suddenly and then killing himself on her wedding day. Um, as a reminder of where that's forever going to be in her memory. And if she, even if she went through with the wedding with the guy, which she didn't, that that would be like her father killed himself on my wedding day. So that would always, you know, forever, forever ruin it, you know? And it's also too, at the, in the end too, however you read it with her dying on the steps in her wedding gown, like you don't know, maybe after her father committed suicide, maybe she jumped and committed suicide on the steps and she's laying there. 
and the whole thing was just something that she's been imagining, you know, it's, it's all how you read, you know, I mean, I was thinking about when I first seen like, why is she in that wedding dress, you know, I love that the whole thing was a dream, like angle. I always love that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a, it is there the, like, on that. Or whatever, but I, I, you still gotta love it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's really good. I, I like that. That's cool. Yeah. Cause I, I know cause it's weird. Cause I mean, you just hear her saying, you know, come to the other side, come to the other side of the mirror. And, then she just like dies on the steps and there doesn't seem to be any cause of it. It's not like she, you know, plunges a knife into her or, you know, cuts her wrists again or whatever. She just dies in her wedding dress. And it's like, well, how did she die? So maybe she already had, yeah. Yeah, because it's like as when the mirror is smashed is when she starts to collapse. And it was also saying as she walks up the steps, she's like regressing. She's moving slower. She's trying to confront the thing, but she's still not sure about it. And then when finally somebody else puts a stop to it, the old woman smashes the thing that finally she can be at ease. Maybe it was her spirit of when she killed herself, or maybe it was the whole father daughter thing. Beyond. Yeah. So it's like that whole thing. And then her collapsing, you know, with the shattering of the glass and she was inside, uh, you know, it's so, it's, and that's, what's too cool. I think about great movies is that they leave it open-ended for, for our people to like talk about and have their own interpretation of why well, I saw this, I saw that, and you start thinking about things, and that is one thing I think that makes a cool movie. It's not just totally cut and dry, and, and it wraps it up in a certain bow, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can bring to it what your, your experiences and perceptions are, too. It's kind of how you, yeah. You make the, the story up along with them. But, uh, yeah, no, so I, I, I definitely like it. Um, I assume you're probably gonna see the original version now and and, 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 and like <laughs> yeah, watch that and stuff. You know, and, I'm a lot more intrigued too. You know, yeah. when you see the one and then you hear there's another verse and you're like, yeah, okay, well, I kind of already have seen that, so I'll just move on to other just films. But I'm so glad that you know you suggested this, and then I thought I had the film. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I, I have two different copies of the same film actually <laughs> in my I thought that I had found the other one but no so yeah I'll, I'll have to to try to seek out the the original and also the third one because that sounds really interesting yeah no and I myself I'm going to try to find the obscene mirror that's the one I don't have is the uh, the obscene mirror the french version and also too technically I mean I have the Spanish version, but I have now because basically the Spanish version they couldn't really show nudity because you couldn't show nudity in Spain, so they would show everything clothes. So basically, the scene when she wakes up to answer the phone, she's wearing a bra, it says, and she's shot from the waist up. But the Spanish version I have, which is the later re-edit of the first version, it's the same scene. She gets up completely naked with her suntan, you know, showing everything, and she answers the phone. Oh, I'm sorry, blah blah, and she wakes up and she goes out that scene's in the Spanish version I have, but it's supposed to be a different scene. So technically I don't have that first version either. Cause she's supposed to be wearing a bra and <laughs> shot from the waist up. So that's what's cool. There's basically like, you know, five, four, six versions of one film of his thing, you know, and some are meaningful and some are just real, the, you know. the is that if they try to look this up on IMDb or even Google it, it's still just going to show you one film, no matter if you search the other side of the mirror, the obscene mirror or the Spanish title, yeah. like all of it is just going to lead you to the same IMDb. <laughs> like there's no, like it re- there's no explanation that there's different films and there's just the one listing on IMDb of the, like it doesn't say Lena Rome anywhere. There's not, you know, like that cast, it's just the original cast and that listing. And so if you're trying to find any info or look for it, you won't find any. So <laughs> you just kind of yeah. have to try to find the, the other, you know, versions out there. Yeah, that's the thing. You got to go through different boards and sites and figure out, you you know, figure out the listing. And I have these different books. And I even like I have, like I said, I have one that I bought that was a completely different retitling. I thought I bought the Obscene Mirror, but I bought the Triple X version. So even I was surprised. I was like, oh, shoot, I don't have that either. You know, so it's it's cool to get into his films because there's so many, you know, French cuts, Spanish cuts, continental cuts, X-rated cuts, you know, all these different stuff. And it's pretty cool as a collector and as a fan you know yeah i mean i don't even think anybody really knows the actual count of just franco films because it's kind of so up in the air about like what constitutes a whole nother film you know you can kind of yeah. with certain numbers but you know it's it's, it's like i mean it, yeah 
It's, a, yeah. it's crazy which output he did. It's just phenomenal. Plus there's films of his that were like finished and lost, or there's ones that were unfinished and put away. And like there's, uh, um, I think it was uh, Camino Solitero or, uh, or the Golden Bug one that was discovered like five years ago and played a film festival. And that came out and they thought that was gone, you know, from 1981. And they found that within the last five, six years. And that came out, you know. Um, right. So, yeah, so there's stuff of his that you just want. Like he made that film with Soldad Miranda, Sex Charade, and that was completed. And then it was lost. It was like he put it somewhere. Somebody picked it up and walked away with it and it's gone. So you hope like one day they're going <laughs> to... No, so there's like stuff of his that is amazing. Yeah, so there's like lost films of his that hopefully one day the whole movie and somebody just picks it up and walks away with it. Like, yeah, I mean, uh... <laughs> there's things of his he left in cabs and left in hotel rooms that he's owed bills on and went to pay it back and they were gone. And he's had such a such a maverick career where he's always on the run and owing people money and right. things and you know. Oh my god! So, yeah. That's- yeah, there's there's quite a few that I've written down. I'm like, oh, I can't get that because of the, like there's Slave of the White Rhinoceros is another one I've been looking for. It has such a great <laughs> title, you know, and it's like this woman that's in this like jungle cult of the white rhinoceros, you know. And Lovely. I'll bring up the white guy that I talked to, and he's like, well, I've never heard of that one. I'm like, yeah, this is it's unfinished. I mean, it was made, but it was put away. the th- The company went under, and you know, it's there, but you know. So I ask for things because it doesn't hurt to ask. They might have it, and you know. So who knows, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. You got to try to, I mean, I, I should uh, connect you with my pal Kyle. Uh, he's actually seen every single Jess Franco film that exists. He is awesome. I, possibly the only person in existence aside from like Jess's inner circle to be able to claim that as far as I would imagine. I don't know if, I mean, how common that is. But yeah, it's not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few authors. That guy did the book Stephen Thrower. I'd probably throw him in the bunch because he's like the authoritative guy you see on all the documentaries and you know commentaries and shit. Tim Lucas, a few of those guys. But yeah, a very rare breed. Yeah, I didn't. It's like I don't know. I'm always like, how did you find that? And he's just like, oh, I, I know people. You know, like he's just uh, you know internet sleuths. But like it's just yeah, he's got the connections or what have you. But he sends me some you know movies that are just impossible to find otherwise, and it's really helpful. But yeah, I should hook you up with him if you need. To start yeah, no, definitely. I think I'm for what I know. I've uh, for what's basically available in Great Market and stuff. I'm only about six away. I've got about 174 DVDs of Franco films and different. You know, like I'll count this as two because it's two. You know, but even though it's one film, so. Probably film wise, I got about 150 something, but DVDs, I got about 178, 179 with the, you know, like Dragula, Dragula Prisoner of Frankenstein, two cuts of that. Uh, Venus and Furs, I got two cuts of that. And, you know. Yeah, you are well, obsessed. It's, I, I, I feel a lot less like crazy. Cause, you know, I, I mean, I, I caught the Franklin bug a couple of years back and I thought I was a little wild, but no. I mean, the whole, po- all the posters behind you right oh, now. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I'm a lot like, of Italian lobby cards. The whole and food, everything, like, wow, they're really amazing. So many and so cool and so classy, all framed. Very, very nice. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I know I've been collecting the lobby cards and the uh, Italian playbills, the Locandias. I got some on this other back wall that you can't see on the other side. Different titles, like Voodoo Passion. I have one for um, titled uh, Porno Shock and then. I got just so many ones, Linda, and the different versions of that. Rug. Yeah, the sheepskin rug right there. <laughs> oh yeah, sheepskin rugs right behind me. That's that's where we do the podcast, right? Right behind me at the little desk there, and I kind of got that because of that. I got this thing. I got to get a small sheepskin rug and test it out. You know, so. cute. Yeah, I actually was like looking at sheepskin rugs after you said that. Like, I should get one for my place to spice. Yeah. Get a little gesture. Zhuz. <laughs> That's what I did. That small one behind me, like a small little deal. I mean, it's smaller than I thought, but that was like about 10 to 15 bucks. You can get a nice, like, uh, you know, eight foot by eight foot for about 100 bucks or something, like a nice floor, you know, deal where you can sleep on and stuff. And it's so soft and they feel really good. That's watching all those girls have sex on the sheepskin rug. It's nice. <laughs> I'm sure I'll put it to good Jess Franker use. Yeah, exactly, you know. Plus, it looks cool to photograph and put things on and take pictures and pose and lay on. And it is multi, multi-purpose. Yeah, so. We'll blend in with it. They're, they have a lot of white fur. You know, they'll love it. Nice. So is there any other notes or thoughts you have about this film that you'd like to add before we wrap this up? 
I mean, I, I think we've gone over it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, crazy death, fashion, jazz, sex, life, love, dancing. <laughs> what, what is your favorite scene or shot in this film? What is the one thing that you go, oh, I totally love this about this film? Usually, like, um, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I, I'm not like it's flashing before my, my mental eyes. Honestly, just, just watching that actress, just she was so kind of like, mel- she was so mellow and, and like so effortlessly enchanting. She just had this air and grace. It was very light. And I don't think I, I really like was so into that the first time because I'm so used to his strong women, you know, that, and, and she was so kind of passive and, and, and uh, yeah, but just her, the way about her, I guess, kind of her, her, her just effortless beauty was, you know, the way that she just kind of handled everything was so like, light and loose. And yeah, she was just very enchanting. I just was just, I don't know. I just liked her. Yeah. I fell she- in love with women so. <laughs> i hear you she uh yeah she was like a feather in the wind you know she just went where it took her and and like the older man who talked to her on the boat he said you know you seem like you're so free and if i didn't think you were so young i would think you were a very old woman because she had that very old soul even though she was so young and free and could just go wherever she wanted do what she wanted with her life and it was no big deal and that's and that's a good role model as well just to take you where you go and and to exist in the moment really not worry about a year down the line or five years down the line just live life day by day and take take it where it goes you know that's kind of the theme of this as well you know which is really a cool idea you know yeah. um for me i'd say two things uh in the original version of this one like i was saying the shot of her with the older man under the glass with the reflection of the house on the on the window i thought that was like totally a beautiful psychological shot and everything all together and then on the third version uh just the old woman watching all the hardcore footage on the mirror before she smashed it all the dick sucking and penetration and everything i just i just that just tickled me like to know and i thought that was so fucking funny <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah for sure that was probably just Frank if I laugh and just, you know, have a little giggle like, oh, this old lady's going to watch this and she's going to watch this and she's going to watch this and then this and then this, you know. So. Nice. Yeah, you got to have the little old lady in there. It's kind of, this is kind of goofy and a little off topic, but just the movie I watched just before this is Van Nuys Boulevard, oh, which yeah. is just a wild, crazy party thing. And there's this one shot in it where like this old woman starts like hitting this race car driver because he was too, being too fast and out of control. And, and she's just like hitting him with a thing and she's just dressed like a little old lady. And you got, I don't know, you just love the little old lady, like getting all worked up kind of thing. But it's funny how we think about like age and, and old women as if women are old women are such, you know, prudes or whatever, as if they didn't live their whole life. And, you know, we're all still young inside. Oh yeah, I know exactly. It's just, it's just what they symbolize is more of the telling you no. Yeah. Basically, that's that's what it boils down yeah, to. Somebody who would be clutching their pearls and all that. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, you're you're and very religious or like old ways. If they like play music too loud, you always see, or you know that type. Right. Of Especially back then, you know. But yeah. So yeah. um. So yeah, uh, I would definitely recommend this film to people, especially the first version, third version. Yeah, I mean, it's got a lot of hardcore stuff, but uh, it moves a lot quicker, and and it's definitely a cool film onto its own as well. So I think both of these are are good films. Uh, And it's cool that you could take one thing and and change a few things around and make it a completely different product than another product on top of that, like a different variant of one thing. As a filmmaker and a creator, I think that's a fucking cool thing to like almost take something and just keep recycling it, making more product out of it and selling that product, you know under different yeah. titles or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that too, actually. Yeah. It works good. Tweaking the painting and tweaking it. And it's never finished. Never as finished as it. You just got to throw it out into the world at some point, but it's still never finished in your mind. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you always find fault or wrong that you can always keep changing and changing, but you have to always figure out that thing. And go. That's one thing, thing, thing I like about Franco too, is that he was always, so prolific and just always put out product and always put out things and, and really didn't like when we talked about changing a few things, but that was more the producers trying to make more product, but he would always 
be making a couple films at the same time or doing things on the side or always just, you know, being prolific and writing and, and always, you know, living everything to the fullest. Yeah. Definitely. It's a kind of bravery that actually, like, I really uh, personally, like, uh, uh, am jealous of because I, I have struggled with that my whole life for sure. Like, I will create, you know, art or I'll write something. Usually it's what I write and I want to put it out, but I think, no, it needs this, it needs that. And then I, I still never release it because I'm just always waiting until it's going to be just exactly perfect. And then your life passes you by and you haven't released anything. And it's, you know, it is really impressive that Jess was just like, yeah, here you go. Like, you know, on, on to the next one. And that, that kind of spirit of just like, okay, like let that be what it is. And I'm just going to keep like, I, 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 I need to adopt that. But I mean, I've been saying that for ages, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's something that just, I think certain people have that spirit, that bravery to just like set their art free and move on to the next instead of like continually trying to, you know, perfectionists, I guess. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, there's something about being a good craftsman. There's something also about holding on to something too. And like we're saying, keep, keep fine tuning, keep fine tuning, keep fine tuning. And, you know, there's two trains of thoughts. Yeah, I mean, definitely you know, doesn't have any of that. You know, he's no yeah. Kubrick. <laughs> exactly. I know. Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing. He just cause that way. You know, if you're always looking ahead and not looking behind, and that's the way you'd kind of to go as well. So that's that's always. A, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess it's just that spirit of Franco, though. That's the whole thing. It's just that he just, you know, flies with it. That he just. He kind of just like just take, goes with the wind, carries him, and he's not. He's just fearless. He just goes forward. And it's, yeah, I, I just really wish I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm very fearless in a lot of ways in life, but then I look at that and I'm like, gosh, that's like goals. I love jazz. Yeah. Same here. I think that that's, that's a good, good finale to wrap this episode up because like, that is like, there is people that know, like there's even a documentary called, just Franco, a way to live. And it's like just admiring who he was and the way he lived all his whole life until the day he died and just kept creating and having that. And that's what keeps you young and keeps you vital is just, you know, staying in that moment and, 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 you know, putting everything out that you love that doesn't burn you out, you know, and burns you out, just keep building from then again and just keep going and going. So, <laughs> so, all right, well, uh, this is going to wrap up this episode of the Franco observer. Uh, do you have anything coming up during this pandemic or any, uh, any things you're working on or anything you want to, you want to say in closing? Oh, um, I guess I didn't plan anything. I don't know. No, I mean, I'm just trying to get through it like everybody else. I'm, and I'm, you know, currently working on a hard ticket to Hawaii puzzle. This is what your, my computer is sitting on. That's kind of my current plan right now. Nice. <laughs> Well, that's very I mean, cool. I, I, you know, I am writing my book eternally. That is the the thing, but but I, I'm not trying to advertise that. It's, it's well, simple. well, <laughs> let the spirit of Franco inhabit you and let you exactly. have that spark to write that novel and finish it up and and to be <laughs> proud and put it out there for everyone to read. You know, so yes, that's like me. I'm planning on doing two films at least this year and I want to keep saying it so it makes me do it. You know, and not do it because I took about a two year break as well and. I got to get back on that horse and, you know, live my life and yeah. do my art. Yeah. Not, you know, exactly. So, so, <laughs> all right. Well, this was a fun talk and we had a very good discussion about the other side of the mirror and, uh, the obscene mirror and, uh, all the other mirrors in between. So almost like a fun house <laughs> with all the mirrors of this versions of this film. So, wow. yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, adios. And we will talk to you next time on the Franco observer podcast. Cheers to all. Cheers, cheers.